All right. Hello, summer 2021 health psychology students. This is the part one of the intro lecture. Um, I want to welcome you to the class and let's go ahead and get going. Okay, one of the take home points of this course this whole semester, especially for those of you in this class who plan to be a future healthcare worker. So a physician, a psychologist, a counselor, music therapist. Um, and, and for those of you who are not interested in being a future healthcare worker, this is going to be personally ideally important to you. And so the news is that human behavior um, our emotions, which are sometimes called our affect, our cognitions, which are called our thoughts or our thought habits that we are in, um, that behavior, emotion, and cognition are all absolutely critical to mind-body health. And a lot of what I'm going to be teaching fits into the psychological orientation that we call CBT which is cognitive behavioral therapy. And we think about cognitive behavioral therapy as kind of fitting into this triad. And the triad is that here's behavior that impacts our thoughts and our feelings. The idea that our emotions and our feelings also drive um, our thoughts, also drive our behavior, meaning that all of these things are connected and they're each driving one another. And so we're gonna think about these components of the human being all throughout the semester with the idea that all of this is going to impact our health. Let's get in some language, um, some, some basic definitions here. When we're talking about integrative medicine, let's talk first about traditional biomedical medicine. So traditional biomedical medicine would be what happens to many of us when we go for medical care. So we go in, we see a doctor or a PA or nurse practitioner, that individual tends to make a medical diagnosis and then that individual tends to prescribe um, medical treatment. So prescription medications um, or some type of procedure or surgery to treat the medical condition. That's traditional biomedical medicine. Now, not everybody in medicine practices that way, but what I want to introduce is integrative medicine. So integrative medicine is going to combine those mainstream medical therapies as well as complementary and alternative medicine therapies. We'll talk about that in a second. Where there's scientific evidence, so it's based on science, um, it's been shown to be safe and effective, um, but with integrative medicine, we're integrating and pulling in other things types of healthcare providers and other types of therapies in addition to the biomedical treatment. So the medication and the procedures, that type of thing. And many health professionals call this practice behavioral medicine. So instead of using prescription medicine as the medicine, they're also using other types of adjunct therapies um, like changing behavior that we do a lot in, in this field. Um, so sometimes called behavioral medicine. Another term you'll hear is CAM or complementary and alternative medicine. And this is when you've got healthcare practices that are not considered to be a part of that conventional biomedical medicine. So an example of a CAM therapy, when I use meditation for my clients or I use um, train them in hypnosis or self-hypnosis, that is a behavioral medicine. It's not a medication. Um, that would be considered complementary and alternative medicine. So maybe for somebody who's got chronic pain and they're on pain meds, adding the mindfulness or the self-hypnosis to that therapy to help them manage their pain more effectively. And keep in mind in complementary and alternative medicine, CAM, that's also scientifically driven. To give CAM a little bit of legitimacy up here, I just want you to know that one of the branches of the National Institute of Health that promotes knowledge and then they also sponsor good scientific research um, for healthcare for individuals in the US, NIH. One of the branches of NIH is NCAM. So it's a whole branch that is focused on studying these types of therapies for individuals. When we talk about the term public health, we're talking about a branch of medicine for public health that includes both um, hygiene, sanitation, epidemiological research. We're gonna have a whole lecture on what is epidemiology this semester for disease prevention and management. And many of you have seen public health really kick into gear during this uh, uh, COVID pandemic, as an example. Public health has been there all along, um, but they've really taken um, a more escalated role. And public health is tax-based funded. So the, the center, like our local public health department, um, is a tri-county 
um, public health department is based on our tax dollars or comes from our tax dollars. And then there's healthcare insurance that we have in the United States. It's usually private insurance like Cigna or Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, healthcare insurance could be public. It could be Medicare that serves 65 and older or people with a registered disability, or it could be Medicaid. Medicaid is by state. Medicare is federally funded, but Medicaid would be healthcare insurance for people in individual states um, based on whatever their poverty line is defined as. And keep in mind the poverty line um, varies by state. So the poverty line um, in California is different than the poverty line in North Carolina, Tennessee as an example. Um, but that is state supported taxes for the poor Again, poor is defined by that poverty line. Um, and Medicaid tends to cover poor children more thoroughly in each individual state than it covers poor adults, as an example. And then you in the United States, our health care insurance and our public health are not well linked up because they're not, we don't have universal health care. We don't have public tax funded health care for everyone. Um, we tend to have a blend of the, you know, the Medicare and the Medicaid for 65 and older and poor individuals, which is tax based public funded. But then a lot of individuals have their health care insurance from a private company like mine is the state health plan from Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's private insurance that um, my employment at ASU funds and then I um, have to pay a certain amount of co-pays and premiums and that kind of stuff. Okay, so we're not well linked in the United States. And one of the things where we're headed in this intro lecture is what has happened in the pandemic. Countries that offer universal public based, tax based um, healthcare, their healthcare insurance for their patients has been better linked to their public health. And then therefore their pandemic response has been a little better coordinated in some countries that have socialized medicine. So let's just get some of this language um, down before we move on. Um, I just wanna define the field of health psychology. So this course that you're teaching um, in terms of the American Psychological Association, um, division 38. So there's a bunch of different divisions in APA. I'm a member of division 38 health psychology division because I was trained as a clinical health psychologist. And this division was formed in 1978, which is gonna sound like a long time ago for you youngsters in this class. But in terms of different fields of psychology, the field of health psychology is very young, okay? Very young in terms of the whole history. And in this field, we merged um, the discipline of psychology, medicine, and public health. We study etiology means causes. We study causes of disease scientifically. We are here to promote health. We are here to prevent illness. We are also here to promote public health policy and improve um, health care. And normally in the field of health psychology, we usually are doing this thing called primary prevention. And primary prevention is we're trying to keep healthy people healthy. So individuals who exercise on a regular basis, um, and when they're doing that, that's primary prevention for heart disease and primary prevention for cancer, as an example. Um, another example of primary prevention would be trying to prevent the spread of the, the coronavirus. So there's been a lot more primary prevention going on worldwide, trying to prevent this virus from going from one person to another. When we think about the term um, behavioral medicine, now we're going into secondary prevention or tertiary prevention. So secondary prevention would be taking somebody's signs and symptoms of disease, trying to prevent full-blown disease. Tertiary prevention would be a person that's got full-blown diagnosable disease, and we're either trying to prevent it from worsening or creating more damage in the body, or we're simply trying to prevent death, okay? So typically in the field of medicine, you, we're treating people with signs and symptoms of disease or full-blown disease, trying to prevent disease from worsening, trying to prevent death. So basically um, most of healthcare is secondary and tertiary prevention. Public health tends to be primary prevention. Behavioral medicine is when we're applying psychology and other social, behavioral, and spiritual services that are based in science, so they're evidence-based, to help people who are diseased. So signs and symptoms of disease, full-blown diagnosis, 
Um, worst case scenario, they're terminal and they're on their way to death. But I want to spend just a moment here talking about this term diseased, because we all know what disease is. You know, there's heart disease and there's stroke and there's cancer, those kinds of things. But disease, when people are diseased, when they have a medical diagnosis, they are diseased. They are stressed usually because of their medical diagnosis, because it's creating um, disability in their life, it's creating pain, they can't do the things they normally wish to do, it's costly, it's affecting their family. But I also want us to know that dis-ease, stress is going to be driving psychological illness and stress is going to be driving medical illness also. So I just wanna pause right here because this term dis-ease is reflecting mind and body illness, and mind and body medicine. There are a lot of different professionals that practice integrative medicine, clinical health psychologists like I am, we practice integrative medicine. There are a lot of music therapists that do this, physicians that do this, um, dietitians that do this, physical therapists that do this. So a lot of different people can engage in integrative medicine. And usually this stuff is what we talk about it being secondary and tertiary prevention. Sometimes we just simply call this or it's better known as treatment or rehabilitation. Okay. Now, people who practice integrative medicine are a little bit different than people who uh, do traditional biomedical model. Sometimes it's called Western medicine, so sometimes it's called allopathic. That would be what we talked about. Go to the doctor, get a medication, get a procedure, get a surgery, that type of thing. That would be biomedical model. And most of US healthcare fits in this biomedical model. So it is only this piece of this big integrative model. But in integrative medicine, we embrace the whole human being. And that's one of the things that's very appealing to me. So we embrace the biological, the organs, the cells, all the way down to the chemistry and the physics. We embrace the psychological, which is the human experience of emotions, cognition and thoughts, human behavior. We embrace the social, which would be relationships. Um, are you single? Are you um, paired uh, in a committed relationship, say with someone romantic? Are you a parent? Are you a child? Um, do you have friends? At the institutional level, it would be things like, um, do you belong to a synagogue or a church? At the institutional level, we are all mountaineers here at Appalachian State University as an example. And then all the way up to the spiritual level. And at the spiritual level, we could be talking about traditional religion, um, but it doesn't have to be necessarily defined that way. It can be defined more broadly. And at a spiritual level, is there meaning in life? Do people have a sense of purpose in life? Um, a lot of that has changed for a lot of people during the pandemic, as an example. Um, do we have a sense of connection with other people? Do we have a sense of connection with God? Do we have a sense of connection with nature? Um, and all the way up to the mystical, kind of believing in there are things that we don't understand, perhaps. Um, a, a typical phrase might be God works in mysterious ways or God knows what is best for individuals or Allah, that type of thing. Um, so the biopsychosocial spiritual model is much broader than the traditional biomedical model. Now, I am going way, way, way back in time when none of us were alive, none of us were even in our mama's ovaries as eggs because I wanna take a look at this dramatic change in what has happened in 120 years in the history of what ails individuals and what has killed people in the United States over time. So we're gonna take a hundred years and then we're gonna come up to modern day times, but then we're gonna even get even more modern and take a look at what has happened during the pandemic because we've had drastic changes um, in the last year and a half for most of us. So back in 1900, leading causes of death were pneumonia and influenza the flu, both infectious diseases, um, both that killed us usually because the lungs were so pussy and infected, they filled up with water, people couldn't breathe and they, they would die. Tuberculosis, also an infectious disease that um, took its toll on the lungs. Um, and just deteriorate the lungs to the point where people would have bloody cough, their lungs would be disintegrating and coughing up, and then they would die, horrible way to die. Intestinal disease was normally the result of eating bad vermin, 
Um, so let's say having to result to eating rats as an example, um, or food that just wasn't sanitized or food that wasn't clean. Um, and it would infect us from the inside out, a horrible way to die. Um, heart disease was number four on the list. Um, likely heart disease and stroke were lower on the list. They're number four because infectious disease was so common. They were number four because people led a healthier lifestyle that protected heart and brain health back in the day where um, they moved around a lot and exercised a lot. Um, and so pretty low on the list there, but then also because the infectious disease would get people young and kill them young. And it wasn't until later in life where individuals would develop heart disease or stroke. After that was kidney disease. After that was accidents. Um, and the accidents was pretty low on the list in 1900 because people didn't move that fast when they would, and if they've come to an abrupt halt. There's a film in the in a movie where they're back in the old days. I think it's year one is the movie. My sons made me watch it when they were here. And it was a, a guy's being pulled by an oxen on a cart. And one of the guys in the cart is like, whoa, way too fast, way too fast. And it, the joke is it's moving really, really slow, you know, the cart and the oxen. Um, nowadays, we can move really, really fast in cars. We can move really, really fast in airplanes, um, on trains. If you're moving really, really fast and come to an abrupt halt, it can kill you. Accidents are much higher on the list nowadays. And then back then, cancer, pretty low, senility, people, you know, again, if they were healthy enough to make it into adulthood, they usually didn't live long enough, and then diphtheria, one more infectious disease. Overall, the pattern back then was infectious disease with some disease that it was influenced by genetics and lifestyle. Now, this is the leading causes of death, uh, modern day causes of death prior to the pandemic. So I want to hit that home. Prior to the pandemic, um, Center for Disease Control data in 2014, number one cause of death in the U.S. was um, coronary heart disease, which we commonly would call death by heart attack. So 50% of all deaths were coronary heart disease for men and for women. Okay, and for women. It's a myth. It's not true that uh, cancer, particularly breast cancer, is the number one cause for women. It was coronary heart disease, just like in men. Women just are protected against um, heart disease and stroke up until menopause. So natural hormones protect women. If we look at, don't worry about these raw numbers here. If we look at what were the lifestyle factors that contributed to coronary heart disease, 65% of the cases or the variance, I should say, the variance of coronary heart disease was attributable to smoking, high fat diet and lack of exercise that we also call sedentary lifestyle. So I'm gonna do this little dance throughout the semester and talk about lifestyle change, three important behaviors. Again, pre-pandemic, we've got other behaviors that are now important, would be if we had a magic wand and we could change any one health behavior for all people in the United States at one swift blow of our wand, magic wand. If we could change the tobacco use, I've got smoking on here, but I should be adding vaping and other types of forms of tobacco. If we could get all the tobacco users using no tobacco, that would have the best impact on the health of people in our country. Second to that would be diet and nutrition. Simplifying it greatly, but Americans are eating way too much fat and they're getting their fat from animal products. So that would be number two. Number three would be getting the couch potatoes, people who are sedentary, up and exercising and exercising as vigorously as possible for them. Those would be the top three health behaviors that would have the biggest impact. Again, pandemic, we're gonna talk about some other behaviors on the table nowadays. Number two and leading cause of death would be cancer death, and that's 23% of all deaths, so 50% coronary heart disease, 23% cancer, and we'll talk about this at the end of the semester when we cover cancer, but half of all men and a third of all women will have cancer in their lifetime, not death necessarily, but will have it in their lifetime. Number three, modern causes of death, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD. Main lifestyle behavior there is uh, smoking and vaping and occasionally exposure to radon, which we have in the hills here in the Boone area. Um, or it could be things like being exposed to asbestos in insulation or working in coal mines or working in like a shipping uh, 
building ships and being exposed to asbestos, airborne asbestos in that occupation. Number four on the list, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, calls this unintentional injury. The other term for this, like we saw in the last slide, would be accidents. So accidents happen and kill people, number four. Cerebrovascular disease, which we normally call stroke, um, would be when there's a blood clot, usually a blood clot, sometimes a bleed in the brain, then the brain dies because it's deprived of oxygen and then the person dies. That's number four on the list. Keep in mind that the risk factors for coronary heart disease are the same risk factors for stroke. It's just the cardiovascular disease. If it gets you in the heart first, that's coronary heart disease. If it gets you in the brain first, that's stroke. And keep in mind for some people, they have both. They've had a heart attack, lived through it, and then they have a stroke after that. Number six on the list, Alzheimer's disease, which is senility, but it's a particular type of medical disease that drives that senility, which nowadays psychologists call dementia. And in the DSM, you would see it as dementia, but a lot of people call it old timers disease or senility um, that happens in old age, Alzheimer's being the medical disease that drives it. Number seven on the list, um, diabetes, and we will talk uh, mid-semester about type 1 and type 2 diabetes. What we are seeing is huge increases in type 2 diabetes because of poor lifestyle for people in the United States. And nowadays, we're actually even seeing um, increases. There are people going into the hospital with um, COVID-19, and they are coming out with type 1 or type 2 diabetes that they didn't have before. So we're seeing the lifestyle driving it. And certainly if you have diabetes, getting infected with the coronavirus is much more dangerous. But then we've got this weird flip thing that's happening where previously healthy people without diabetes are getting this virus and they are um, surviving it and not dying, but then having diabetes after that. What was number one on the list in 1900 is now number eight on the list, influenza and pneumonia. And my bet is keep in mind that the flu usually doesn't kill people. What kills people is if they get the flu and the flu grows into pneumonia. And so you will oftentimes see pneumonia deaths, but then you will see flu driven pneumonia deaths. And then likely what we're gonna see in upcoming months, years for Center for Disease Control data on people in the United States and worldwide is we're gonna see pneumonia deaths um, increase that were coronavirus infection driven pneumonia deaths. Okay. And keep in mind when I use this terminology, you don't, when people get infected with COVID-19, they're not dying of COVID-19. They're usually dying of complications from COVID-19. Flu, um, I'm, I'm sorry, pneumonia being one of the more common ones at times they're dying of their heart stops or they have kidney failure. Um, so we're gonna see this changing around over time because of that. Number nine on the list is nephritis. Nephritis is kidney failure that is usually driven by diabetes nowadays. Again, we're gonna see more cases of things like kidney failure because of COVID-19 infection. Um, so there's gonna be a big mix up of this kind of what's the number one, number two, number three um, happening. And then number 10 on the list is suicide. And keep in mind of this, this is all people in the United States. I, I wanna say Americans, but I know that's selfish to say we're the Americans because there's the Canadians, there's the South Americans. But anyways, in the US, um, this is leading cause of death for all people. And the best predictor of death is age. So normally when we're talking about this stuff, we're talking about older people. Okay, normally. CDC also keeps track of uh, death of young people and they define young as 15 to 24. Number one cause of death for young people, unintentional injuries or accidents. Uh, number one in that list would be motor vehicle accidents. There's a reason why you guys pay higher premiums for your car insurance than you gals have to pay for your car insurance is because guys drive more haphazardly. They take more risk behind the wheel and therefore they have more accidents that are just like, you know, costly to your car that has to be repaired with your insurance, but even costly 
to your life. Um, so that, that's the reason why guys pay more for health and I mean, for car insurance. I've got one son with the lead foot and one son with the very light foot and the lead foot son has had many tickets and pays a lot for his car insurance. I know all about this. Number two on the list for young people is suicide. And when we start looking for risk factors for suicide, I'm not really going into great detail in this class. I go into more detail in my abnormal site class. The number one risk factor, most people, if I were to ask you, you would be like, oh, psychological. So it's either like bipolar disorder or depression or panic disorder or PTSD. And yes, those things are risk factors for suicide, but the number one risk factor for suicide is access to lethal means. And the number one form of lethal means for individuals um, who die of suicide or make a suicide attempt um, would be a gun. And guns are very effective at creating death and suicide. And so having an availability of a lethal means like a gun, which is very high death versus like pills, which is very low death, almost like a, like 1% um, in a suicide attempt. And it's very high, um, 95 to 90, 90, 99% with a gun, which is why when we do intervention for somebody who is high risk for suicide, we count, it's called CALM, Counseling Against Lethal Means. We help them get the lethal means distance. And so that could mean having parents um, locking up gun and then locking ammunition and making sure that the key is hidden or it's a key code that say the, the teenager in the house who's at risk does not have access to. Or it is also possible to have local police departments or local sheriff's departments come and securely take firearms and keep them temporarily. Um, it is also, we, we do a lot of this in this rural area when we're intervening, is having um, family members who do not live in that home take the firearms and secure them in their home, keep them away temporarily when people are not feeling well or feeling um, potentially suicidal. Homicides, number three on the list. Um, and keep in mind, this is young people. And this is especially a problem for um, indivi young individuals of color, particularly in urban areas where there is gang violence, or as we know, because we've seen it in the news, this is part of why Black Lives Matter has resurfaced um, in social activism and politics recently. Um, police officers killing um, people of color, much higher proportions than um, white individuals who are young individuals. Cancer is number four on the list and heart disease is number five on the list. Young people do die of heart disease, um, not nearly as commonly as older people, number one on the list. Okay, now, as of uh, this past year and a half, COVID complications from COVID infections that um, cause death are now the leading cause of death in the United States. Um, and starting last year, I want to show this slide. So let me, I'm going to stop my share here for a second. I am going to um, escape and put this into my browser because I want to, oops, sorry, yeah. I have to talk when I do this. I know it can be annoying for those of you watching, but if I don't talk my way through this, I never like to make it through. I do wanna show you the dramatic change that has occurred. So let me pop this in my browser and let me go into it. And let me pause it. And now I will screen share again. Come all the way back around. Okay, I'm going to screen share and show you this interactive graph. And I, I show this and keep in mind, we have not kept up with all of the other leading causes of death. Um, so this started March 1st in 2020. And as you all know, it was in the middle of March. So we had our spring break after the first week in March. And then remember, that's when like shutdown happened. Um, for us, it happened all over the world. It had happened before all over the world, but that's when it started happening in the United States. That's when our government was like, oh, this thing really is bad and it's happening in horrible ways in other countries in the world. Maybe we should do something too. Um, 
So this was March 1st of 2020. And the leading cause of death back then was heart disease. And then after that, cancer, the stuff that we've talked about. But I want you to watch this. This is going to end at the end of April 2020. I just want you to see how dramatic this was in leading causes of death. So let's watch this. That's when shutdown happened. And look how quickly, look how quickly that rose. So actually the shutdown happened at a pretty important opportunistic time, but keep in mind the shutdown happened after a lot of people were already infected and spreading infection. So again, by April 28th of 2020 in the United States, this had now become the leading cause of death in the United States. So that is how fast a lethal infectious disease can create havoc. Okay, so let's go back to PowerPoint here. So I wanna hit home this point, you all. So as of April 27th and 2020, this was the leading cause of death, complications from COVID infection. Um, and it had killed at that point in time, 2,470 people in the United States. If you want to see updated data, you can go to the Center for Disease Control dashboard, and that's got, it's got everything nowadays. It's got number of cases accumulated over time currently, uh, number of deaths accumulated over time currently. It's got hotspots in the U.S., and now um, up on the dashboard is information about um, vaccinations, how many people have vaccinated, how many people have antibodies, so lots and lots and lots of information there. So as of 2021, May 11th, we have seen, keep in mind there were you know, about 2,500 deaths back in April when it took over leading cause of death. As of May 11th, we were at um, 32 million and a half, over a half cases in the US. And we were up to well over half a million deaths um, from COVID complications in the United States. By the time you all view this lecture, it will be much higher than that. If you want the updated data, you can go to the Center for Disease Control dashboard, which is, a, which is US data. World Health Organization is also keeping a dashboard and that's got data all over the globe. The reason why this is called pandemic, many of you know this already, is because it is affecting more than one country in the globe and it is affecting all countries. Um, I want you to know that the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services um, has been keeping track of um, what's going on in North Carolina. I can tell you North Carolina compared to a lot of states has been very progressive, um, very progressive about the lockdown that was upsetting to a lot of people because they were worried about freedoms and businesses and, and businesses going under, which a lot of them have. Um, but we've actually been quite progressive in North Carolina in terms of managing the pandemic. Whereas historically, we have not been very progressive in North Carolina um, with other healthcare issues. Um, so this is one of the places where we sort of broke rank. And a lot of this has to do with Dr. Mandy Cohen, who is the lead medical doctor leading us in North Carolina. And she has been, I've got a girl crush on her. She has been absolutely fabulous at looking at the data, recommending to our state government and, and Roy Cooper, our governor, as well as the, um, the legislature in North Carolina, recommending guidelines um, for laws and policies. She has also been very in tune with discrepancies, particularly racial discrepancies, and who's most at risk and been very progressive in trying to um, get testing and get health care and get vaccinations out to the most vulnerable individuals in North Carolina. Know that you can look at their dashboard and gather information. Um, I do want to just real quickly talk about when we talk about this term, you don't hear it as much in the media now as we heard it early on. And unless we get some variants and some new outbreaks, you're going to hear about flattening the curve even more again. But the flattening the curve was not necessarily trying to reduce the number of cases and reduce the number of deaths. We Certainly, we have those goals. Those are in place. Yes, we want to reduce spread of infection. Yes, we want to do reduce the seriousness when people get infected. Yes, we want to be able to give healthcare. 
the flattening the curve is really about the healthcare capacity. And so if we did not have social distancing, masking, lockdown, all that kind of stuff, the number of cases that would have needed hospitalization and even within hospitalization, rationing ventilators. So, you know, people get really bad off, they have to go to the hospital and they get intensive care. If they're really bad off in intensive care, they need a ventilator. If we had way too many people needing that hospitalization, needing ICU, needing a ventilator, then the number of cases would exceed what is happening in our ability to provide people with hospitalization and the ventilators. This is happening in India right now when I'm recording this lecture mid-May. India is way beyond their capacity to give people needed health care. So when we talk about flattening the curve, we actually talk about spreading out those who are infected and needing that intense health care hospitalization across time. So slowing the spread so that when people need that hospitalization, they could get it. Now, what that means for a lot of cases is we've just delayed people getting infected and getting sick, but when we use the term flattening the curve, it's trying to keep the number of people who need that intense health care low enough that the hospitals could care for them. And then I think you all know this, a lot of healthcare providers who are practicing other forms of medicine are now in intensive care, taking care of COVID patients. For uh, a lot of individuals, that means that they didn't have access to those specialty healthcare providers in other areas because they've all been, they've been moved over and triaged. Um, if you're Gray's fans anatomy, uh, Gray's anatomy fans, they had to do that. You saw a lot of people that were doing, you know, practicing surgery or practicing something else. We were moved over into the ER intensive care practicing. And then no, Center for Disease Control keeps track of state data if you want to look some of that stuff up. Um, UNC TV um, periodically law offers these live streams, Governor Cooper, Dr. Mandy Cohen, as well as um, politicians and other individuals that would speak on that. You all know this stuff at this point in time, Appalachian Health Department still recommending the hand washing, still recommending the six feet social distancing. If you cough, cough into your mask, cover it put it into your, your elbow, particularly if you've got clothing in your elbow, if you have to cough or sneeze, keep away from people who are sick, avoid touching your face. Oh my gosh, I have realized during the pandemic, I'm like, oh, face touchy all the time. And I've really had to work on that really, really, really. And now I try to do stuff like, if I have to lean on my chin, do this, try to keep my fingers out of my eyes, go wash my face before I itch my eyes, all that kind of stuff. Um, we are doing a lot more disinfecting. Early on in the pandemic, I was like crazy lady with a disinfecting spray and wipes. I do that a lot less now because now we know, we did not know this at the beginning, fomite transmission, transmission where you touch a surface and then let's say I itch my eyes after I've been in the grocery store and touched a surface that may be infected or light switches that were infected. Fomite transmission is very low now. We did not know that at the beginning. Um, I even had friends who in the beginning were would, would leave their shoes outside and after they had to go to the grocery store would come in and shower head to toe and then I was like, oh, should I be showering head to toe after that? And I wasn't. Um, now we know this is this is a less common form of transmission than we did back then. And then the face coverings, you all know. My saying, the couple of times I've seen my grown sons um, and their whereabouts, it's like cover your face holes. And then the second thing I would say, because then they'd have it down here, I'd be all of them. <laughs> cover your face holes, all of them. And it drives me crazy when I see people with their noses hanging out in a public place like a grocery store. Okay, so dramatic changes in pattern. Let's talk about those changes that have occurred. So SARS, the virus is the SARS um, COVID-2 is the virus. It started in 2019, which is why it gets called COVID-19. And keep in mind, we know, we know this, I don't have this on the slides, but we know based on Red Cross blood tests, so people who donated in 2019, blood, donated their blood, they've gone back and tested that blood. We were seeing the virus in the United States as early as December 15th in 2020. Twenty, And you all have heard those stories. You've heard those people that got sick, sick, sick in December, January, February, sicker than they've ever been. And in some cases, some people died and they did not know what it was. And if they went to healthcare and got screened for 
flu virus. They screened negative for flu virus. And now we know that a lot of those people, particularly when they saw lost sense of taste and smell, had fever, had chills, all the classic kind of coronavirus symptoms, that it was here. It was here in December of, um, I'm sorry, December 2019. Okay, it was here that early, not 2020, December 2019, based on Red Cross. So these coronaviruses, there's a whole family of these viruses, and the one that creates um, COVID-19 is the SARS-CoV-2, large family of viruses that mainly live in birds and mammals. And this creates severe acute respiratory syndrome, um, and so it's the sequel to the SARS-CoV-2. Um, very similar to um, SARS and also a coronavirus that emerged in the Middle East back in 2002. Many of you don't remember that. It's called MERS, um, which is the disease there. These viruses jump from bats. Remember, bats suck blood out of usually mammals. And so if the bats are carrying it and they have it in their their mouths and their saliva, they bite their prey and they suck their blood, they transmit the virus into the bloodstream of their prey that way. It was thought that um, it went through an intermediary organism that has been debated a bit. Um, it was thought that it would went through a fish or it went through a pangolin where bats be, bit these intermediary mammals, let me get my word straight, and then the humans would buy the dead mammals to eat them, particularly in these open markets that are common in rural China. And a lot of times these, um, they're not well preserved with the refrigeration or freezing, and they're not well preserved with cooking them right away. And so therefore uh, the virus proliferates and reproduces in these dead mammals. And then it makes it really easy for the humans who eat the mammals um, to transmit the infection. Um, Another possibility was the bats that directly bit humans. Um, this is being debated. I don't really don't care a whole lot about it. What I do know is it wasn't made in a human lab in um, Wuhan, China. It seems like it was traced back to bat transmission. So the SARS COVID 2, coronavirus 2, is the one that specifically causes the disease COVID 19. Much like an HIV virus would cause the disease that we cause a, called AIDS, as an example. So that's why we've got these different terms. Pre-COVID, the pattern between um, uh, 100 years ago, 125 years ago at this point in time or about, um, there was less infectious disease and contemporary causes of death, a lot more lifestyle-driven disease, a lot more chronic disease, where, as an example, coronary heart disease, heart attack, number one cause of death before the pandemic. Um, we have seen in young adult men signs of um, cardiovascular disease. So this progressive chronic disease, people don't start having symptoms or limitations until later on in life when the disease progresses. Lots and lots of drain on the healthcare system because the disease is going on for a long time. A lot of that lifestyle influence, that smoking, vaping, poor diet or eating excessive fat, excessive calories, um, and then the sedentary lifestyle, people not moving very much. And then there was a lot of disease reve revealed in the elderly. And again, best prediction of disease age at the time before the pandemic, um, although we're seeing ages of vulnerability during the pandemic also. And one way of thinking about lifestyle disease, the more years people are engaging in unhealthy lifestyle, the more years it's creating chronic disease, the more likely that disease is going to reveal across age in the elderly. Factors that change the pattern, dramatic shift. Okay, so the stuff that, that shifted between 1900 and 2019, immunizations, childhood diseases, okay? Most of us in this class have not had um, chicken pox. We have not had mumps. We have not had scarlet fever. Um, all, we've not had polio. All this stuff that was killing kids back in this last century here, childhood immunization, immunizations have about wiped out those diseases, okay? Some really simple things that aren't very romantic and not very high tech, 
water purification and sewage sanitation. In those 120 years, we got really good in industrialized countries. Now this is different in developing countries. We got really good at keeping our poop and our urine and our trash out of our drinking water. And having clean water has made a huge difference. Being able to preserve our food, refrigeration, and, and proper ways of uh, storing food, behavior lifestyle change, and preventative health care um, change that from infectious to lifestyle disease. But starting in 2019 and 2020, changed the world. If we look at from a public health perspective, were we prepared for the pandemic? In the United States, we could have been more prepared. Okay, Dr. Fauci, um, Center for Disease Control, um, there was a whole task force appointed um, to these types of viral infections prior to the last administration in the federal government. The U.S. was not very well prepared. Okay, other countries in the, in the, in the globe, particularly our sister industrialized countries like Germany, like Sweden, um, were better prepared. They locked down earlier. They started precautions earlier. Were we prepared for vaccines? Yes, we were prepared in the United States and globally, but not because of our government. We were more prepared because of private pharmaceutical companies, and we were more prepared with um, organizations like the Gates, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so these private foundations and these pharmaceutical companies were on this. And the way that they were on this is we had Eco Health, and we're gonna get to this a little bit more in the next slide. Um, uh, Dr. Dazic and EcoHealth were monitoring the viruses in the bats on the other side of the globe in China so that we knew ahead of time, these pharmaceuticals, the Gates Foundation, EcoHealth, we knew ahead of time the possibility of kinds of viruses that would come from these bats and go to human beings. And so they were already mapping genetic codes of these potential viruses to know what might start infecting humans what might be the way of treating these viruses in humans, um, as well as how to start creating vaccines that would prevent the spread of these viruses in humans. So from a vaccine standpoint, we were globally progressive. That was a good thing. Now, in an unexplained change of what happened, the United States government, this has never happened before, the National Institute of Health was funding EcoHealth, and I want you all to watch that Netflix um, clip on that, was funding EcoHealth where they were tracking these viruses and the bats in China so they would know what was being transmitted um, to human beings. The National Institute of Health for political reasons, they were told by the federal government to pull funding from EcoHealth, and that happened May of 2020. That has scared the bejeebies out of me because there are now happening right now bats with new viruses transmitting them to human beings and we will not be as knowledgeable as we used to be in knowing the genome of some of those viruses. Um, this, they are now back up and better funded, um, a lot of reasons because private foundations have kicked in. We were not very well prepared in the United States in terms of the manufacturing of uh, protective gear. And so you've heard of a lot of healthcare workers not having the N95 masks that they needed, not having the protective gear, reusing cloth masks, stuff that they never should have been doing, reusing disposable masks, stuff that they weren't, shouldn't have been doing. We were way behind in production of ventilators um, in the United States if we had thought more thoroughly and prepared more, we'd have done that. In terms of medications, yes, private pharmaceuticals have done very well because they were ahead of the game, tracking the viruses, knowing what was coming our way. They have done well with FDA approved um, medications. There is now um, research on antibodies, Regeneron. 
So when former President Trump was hospitalized, um, he was given um, the FDA approved medication. He was also given the experimental medication Regeneron, which was antibodies coming from other people who had had the virus. Um, and we are we are thinking this is going to be good um, once we they get full FDA approval. So a dramatic overtake in infectious disease in 2019, 2020. We know the first diagnosed cases um, of this zoonotic transmission um, were human cases in Wuhan, China. Also political, the, the first um, medical doctor who saw cases of this um, tried to get public health information out of his hospital, out of his region in China. And he was met with disdain. He was fired from his job trying to communicate to the world what had started at ground zero in Wuhan. He was fired from his job and um, bless his heart, he died. He died from the infection. So he was on the front lines taking care of people but again, his attempt to vocalize and get the news out was also met with disdain. So we have seen it's been interesting in a lot of different countries in the US, even in China, trying to um, quash communication about what was going on um, and trying to prevent the scientific information from getting out to the public, which I, from a political standpoint, think is a shame. We know the number one way that this virus is transmitted is person to person. And the most common way it is transmitted is from droplets from person to another person. And this is why we do things like the six feet. This is why we do things like wearing the mask. We keep our droplets to ourselves when we're wearing a mask. Um, and then we also protect ourselves from other people's droplets um, when we're wearing a mask and then the six feet. But I want to look at some of the science of some of this droplet stuff. When we cough, we spew out 3,000 droplets. They can go at a speed of 50 miles per hour and they can travel as far as 20 feet. So this six foot thing is better than five foot, five foot's better than four foot, but the six foot is slightly arbitrary when we look at some of this um, data. A sneeze, 30,000 droplets, they can go 20 feet again, but 200 miles per hour. We, when we sneeze, we send those babies fast. Just regular breathing, 50 to 50,000 droplets. When we are speaking, that increases 500 to 500,000 droplets. It, now, I used to teach this class in IG Greer or in 112 Blick in the, in the library. And I don't ever use a microphone when I teach live in those big classrooms because I can project my voice. This has made me realize, and I'm sorry, tell if you know past students, tell them I'm sorry, how much I have been spitting on my students over the years when I lecture. Oh my gosh, especially those students in the front rows, I've been spitting all over them. Gross, gross. Also know that singing even emanates more, again, um, than just normal speaking. Infection happens exposure to the virus times time. So especially if we are, let's say, caretaking for somebody sick in the home, we're not masked and we are exposed to them breathing on us, coughing on us over time, a lot more likely to get infected in those situations. This R not thing is the number of new cases each existing case generates. And the average calculated by the Center for Disease Control, this was back um, originally, was each one case of an infected person was infecting 2.5. This over time, it, when cases spike, it has risen, but overall, because of the public health precautions, the masking, the distancing, the lockdowns, all that has kept that from getting crazy, crazy high. When we talk about incubation period, we're talking about the period of time between when a person has contracted the virus and they are infected and the onset of their symptoms. One of the scariest things about this particular virus is that we could become infected and, and shed and give the virus to other people, even if we're asymptomatic. So we never knew we were sick. We just had the virus and we were spreading the virus. Another scary thing that's kind of unique to this virus that was a little different from things like the flu is 
when we get infected before, let's say we get sick. So we know like, oh, I'm sick and then get tested, that kind of thing. We are most infectious before getting sick. So spreading it at a higher rate before being sick than even after being sick. And then the infectious period is two days before the onset of symptoms. Um, some people never knew because they're asymptomatic, which is why a lot of you have gone and gotten tested, particularly before you visit friends or you visit relatives, even if you didn't think you had it because some of you were testing positive, you did have it, you could be spreading it to other people. And then it tends to last the infection and the, the potential to spread it 10 days after the onset of symptoms or at least three days post fever, which is why we tend to do the quarantine thing and particularly the two week quarantine thing. Okay. Transmission, um, most of it is contact transmission. And so that would be direct contact with an infected person, caretaking, breathing their droplets, um, their droplets going into our nose, into our mouth, um, getting into our lungs, handshake of somebody who was infected, um, who had, let's say coughed in their hand, we handshake, we rub our eyes, like I like to do a lot and transmit it that way. Most of it, um, contact and droplet, okay? And again, early on in the pandemic, we thought that fomite transmission, touching stuff like a non-surface area and then touching our face was more common than it is. So most common droplet, direct inhalation of a person's droplets within six feet of them. Um, airborne transmission, um, it can suspend in, in the air for hours, which is why we've paid a lot more attention to being outside than inside. Inside, we paid a lot more attention to good ventilation. Even ASU for energy savings used to recycle air within the buildings. And once we knew this was going on in the pandemic, they have stopped doing that. All of the buildings heated, air conditioned, pulling outside air in, heating or cooling it before it ventilates inside the buildings. Um, we know in closed spaces, especially dangerous, prolonged exposure, especially dangerous and inadequate ventilation. The restaurant eating, um, nowadays you're seeing more people eat in restaurants after they've been fully vaccinated. But um, before the vaccines, we know that people who got the tested positive and got the infection were twice as likely to be eating in restaurants than people who were testing negative and were not infected. So restaurant transmission, a pretty serious one. Um, certainly large scale gatherings, quite serious. Fomite transition, again, early on, we were very worried about this and they even found in some of the cruise ships that had lots of infected people, the virus was lasting on services for up to 14 days. Um, now we know that to be rare. Behaviors, key to transmission. I want you to read the COVID, um, how to avoid on the ASU sheet. Um, watch the Netflix, um, clips about this. Most people who have become infected have become in their living space. And usually in their living space, it's other people, either they got it outside their living space and brought it into the home or other people who were leaving li living space to work were bringing it into their living space. And so most infections were outside coming in. And that would be bringing it into your home, people who were captive in nursing homes, um, which is why nursing homes were not allowing visitation or the nurses were getting it outside or the doctors and bringing it into the nursing homes. Jails were high spreaders um, because people were captive in their living environment, um, which is why some states have prioritized more vulnerable populations for earlier vaccines. Other states have not. It's been interesting to see the ethical decisions that different states and different counties have made. Um, public bathrooms are high touch areas. Um, we do know, and this scared me early on if I had to be teaching in classrooms, we do know that when a person is infected, they shed the virus in their feces. And so it is possible, and keep in mind, a toilet flush makes stuff in feces, this is gross when you think about it, this is why you can smell it. Um, it becomes airborne, the flesh makes 
particles and feces airborne. So it is possible if you go into a public restroom, especially unmasked, and you breathe airborne feces particles from somebody else to become infected that way. The thing that scared me a bit about campus is like I know the toilet seats like in the student union have lids. So ideally a person flushes feces, lowers the lid um, before they flush so it doesn't become airborne. The toilets in Smith Wright Hall where most site classes were hold do not have seats. Okay, And so there's a, there was concern about that. Um, most of the faculty um, housed in Smith and Wright and psychology went online in their classes. 44% um, of people who are infected are asymptomatic. They can shed for quite a few days. Again, most contagious before the symptoms start. And then certainly we've heard about these super spreading events. One of the closest super spreading events to us in Boone, um, the chicken plants in Wilkesboro, as an example, um, had lots and lots of positive cases, meat packing plants, people going to weddings, funerals, birthday parties. A lot of people have not gone to their places of worship um, during the pandemic. I have found it interesting, particularly when I'm biking in a rural area around here on Sundays, how many of the churches were having in-person inside services. A lot of the um, places of worship have tried to move to outside services. Nowadays, um, many are resuming masked. People working in close spaces and businesses, we've already talked about restaurants. Airports have actually done pretty well and airplanes have done pretty well if they require full-time masking. Airplanes are actually well ventilated relative to um, other indoor spaces and then less people have been flying so there's been less crowding, there's been spacing, masking, all that stuff. Classrooms, some of you have had indoor classes that have been socially distanced, masked, all that stuff. And then indoor sporting events, um, which is why we had, you know, it, sporting events where people would have to live in the bubble. They've condensed their season, stuff like that. I think you all know the behaviors to protect yourself. So I'm not going to go into that. Um, this is some updated data as of mid-May in vaccines. Um, well over 50% of people in the United States have had one, at least one dose of the vaccine. The first dose for the ones that require two doses give a lot of protection. That second dose, man, really brings home the specificity of the um, immunity. Um, and some of them require two, like Moderna and Pfizer. I was a Moderna candidate. I had the two doses. Um, ASU, as of mid-May, has done 57,000 tests, so pretty high testing. ASU prides themselves on a low positivity rate um, as of midway, May 1.8%, while North Carolina at the same time is up at a positivity of 5.7. Some of that could be real measures of people who are really positive. Some of that could be because when testing is easily available, like the ASU clinics, a lot of people tend to go get tested, even when they're not suspecting infection, they might get tested because they're going to go visit a relative and want to make sure that they're negative. Um, I have um, one friend who just kind of tested pretty frequently, um, almost as a habit, um, was, was anxious. Um, but again, getting tested when you need to know if you could be giving it to other people is a really good idea. Vaccines, um, ASU has been running vaccine clinics um, as of mid-May, um, over 4,000 vaccines have been given. Um, ASU has a quarantine and meal support program. So for students who were sick and had to go into quarantine, they might be have a paid hotel room. They might have um, people bringing uh, thermometers, food to them. Um, ASU has 98% availability right now mid-May. Keep in mind though, school's not in session. We're in between you know, spring semester and first summer. So it'll be interesting to see how these numbers kind of move into a different pattern in summertime or move into a pattern in fall time. Most classes um, are offered online in the summer. We're trying to go back in the fall. We're definitely trying to go back to classrooms in psychology, but we're gonna do wait and see. Other departments have been heavier on in-classroom and online. And then just, just for fun and giggles, 13 police reports um, have been filed against ASU students for gatherings of large amount of people at a time. 
when we think about the vaccines we have, I want you to watch the Netflix race for the vaccine. Boy, we, we raced fast. And again, we can say thank you, pharmaceutical companies. Thank you, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, because you all have saved us in that pre-research prior to this um, and getting these vaccines moving through the um, stages of scientific approval and then FDA approval. So now we've got a lot available to us. So Johnson & Johnson is a one injection, 66% effectiveness, which is definitely better than zero. Um, it is a viral vector. It can be kept in the fridge, which is nice and convenient. One injection kept in a fridge, it's easier to push this out to rural areas. Pfizer and Moderna are both two injections. Um, the first injection gives basic immunity, second injection, very specific immunity. Pfizer three weeks apart, Moderna four weeks apart. Um, Pfizer, actually, I think the data is closer to like 94%. Earlier research was 90. Moderna, 95%, very high effectiveness. Um, these are both, are, they've got the little genetic code on the little corona or the head, the top of the virus. If you take those particles and you inject them in people, the body goes, oh, virus. I recognize that it's a virus. And then you get immunity um, based on that little genetic particle. Problem with both of these, they need very, very cold. This is cold. This is incredibly cold to be able to store these. And so transportation has been an issue. Once you open a vial after it's like come to room temperature, you got to give all of those doses and those and those vials to people. You can't like let it come to room temperature and then put it back in the fridge for somebody else tomorrow. Um, but very good immunity. The AstraZeneca, uh, which we don't see a lot of in the United States, I don't even think it has FDA approval right now, 70% protection. This is more of a live pathogen, regular fridge though, so it's easier to push this out into rural areas in the globe. And I wanna compare all of this to the influenza or the flu vaccine, which many of you were getting on a yearly basis, usually in the fall, pre-winter. I would get mine every year, like religion. Um, um, this only would offer 40 to 60% protection, depending on the year, depending on the strain. And so when you look at these levels, this is really nice compared to flu vaccine. Um, it is usually a dead virus. They find whatever's going around the strain, uh, make sure it's dead, and they would inject that in into people's arms. Okay, last slide on part one here. So... The contribution of behavior to health, or we could look at the flip side of that to illness, pre-pandemic, behavior was accounting for 40% of our overall health status, okay? So that would be things like, do we do health behavior? Do we eat well? Do we exercise on a regular basis? Do we not smoke? Flip side of that could be bad behavior that was driving illness, like smoking, being sedentary, eating a really bad diet. Genetics accounting for um, overall, some of our overall status. Um, access to medical care, 10% of our overall status was access to medical care. But I do wanna emphasize um, in the United States, we definitely have the haves who are people who had good insurance, um, health insurance. And then we have the have nots, which would be people who are underinsured. They've got crappy health insurance or even more so the people who were uninsured, they had no health insurance and they did not have access to Medicaid or Medicare. Um, and the haves and the have nots take on particular demographics. And we've seen the same thing happening during the pandemic. So the haves tend to be white people, particularly white men, less white women, less white children, but overall privilege to white people in terms of having good health insurance. Have nots tend to be people of color, particularly people of color who are women and children. Um, and then also deeper into the demographics, have nots, individuals who identify as um, not um, heterosexual, so identify as bisexual, pansexual, and then also have nots tend to be tran trans individuals. Um, the other component, so the haves and the have nots in healthcare, and we're gonna spend some time in the, uh, the future lectures in the intro here on that. Other factors would be things like um, our homes, our work setting. I am a haves 
Um, I have not been made to do classroom teaching, particularly at a time where we weren't up on all the safety precautions in the classroom teaching. Can't wait to get back to the classroom when it's fully safe. My job is safe. Um, teaching psychology, doing research in psychology, seeing, seeing my clients as a clinician, very safe kind of profession, um, much more hazardous profession, firefighters, um, police officers, as an example. Another example would be my grandfather. I come from Hatfields and McCoys, come from some West Virginia lineage and some rural Virginia lineage. My grandfather um, got black lung from working in the coal mines and he died of complications from black lung. That was a work situation that was very hazardous, okay? <clears throat> so when we're talking about other factors, we're talking about that kind of stuff. The contribution of behavior post-pandemic um, is not well known, but it does seem to be that mask wearing, when we have had to interact with other individuals, has been quite protective. We have seen that social distancing, six feet, has been quite protective. The hand sanitizing, still a smart thing to do. I don't think I will ever go into a public place like a grocery store and get in my car and not sanitize my hands ever again. I will always, I think I will always, that new habit, I will always do that. And I'm even debating, like, I wonder if in the future when I go into public places, if I'm going to mask, even if you're not supposed to be masking. It brought down flu rates this last winter, as an example. That stuff, very protective. Being on lockdown, as long as we weren't exposed to somebody who was infected, has been quite effective, but now we're kind of knowing that maybe lockdown was not as important as we earlier thought lockdown would be. Okay, Getting health professionals, all the um, high, high end protective um, gear has been very effective. And then now we're seeing, and we're even tracking it. So we've got the, we know the effectiveness of vaccines. Now we're starting to see some real world studies. So effectiveness of spread in nursing homes, effectiveness of spread after vaccination in healthcare settings. We're starting to see real world effectiveness pan out um, as well as like the data that was given to the Federal Drug Administration to get those vaccines on the market and out there to people. Um, so it'll be interesting to see, but I think we're seeing behavior even more important to preventing spread of infection, even more important to lifespan during the pandemic than we saw pre-pandemic. All right, I'm gonna pick up on part two um, with these health behaviors and part two of the intro lecture. So I'm going to say goodbye for today. Um, thanks everybody for listening. Do take notes on these lectures. Do take notes on the documentaries and the clips that you watch on as you learn, light notes at least for those things. Um, anything that I present in class will be fair game for your learning, fair game for your exams. All right, everybody. See ya. Take care.